To those critics that say that a preacher should not be living a life of luxury, what is your response to that? They're wrong. Okay, the creepy smile is not helping anything. This is The Laws of Prosperity by Kenneth Copeland. Apparently it was written like a long time ago, back in like 1974 or something like that. At first, I thought this book was going to be about Kenneth Copeland trying to get you to send him your money. And it sounds like that's at least part of it. But based on what I've read so far in the book, it actually seems like it's him trying to justify being filthy rich. Now, this is not the first part. If you haven't seen the others, don't sweat it. This stands independently of the rest. I'll provide context if it's missing. But I wanted to read through Kenneth Copeland's book, basically justifying being filthy rich, despite the fact that there's a verse right in the Bible that says it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. He never really did answer that question for us, how he gets past that problem. To those critics that say that a preacher should not be living a life of luxury, what is your response to that? They're wrong. Okay, the creepy smile is not helping anything. That's it? That it's a misunderstanding of the Bible. Okay. That if, if you go into the old covenant, Oh, no. He's about to say something super anti-Semitic, isn't he? Do you think the Jewish people believe you should be broke? The oh, boy. The Bible also says that it's more difficult for a rich man to get into heaven than it is for a camel to get through the eye of a needle, correct? Thank you. So tell us how you get around that. rest of the scripture. But he said, all things are possible with God. Wow. Okay, so Kenneth Copeland lists this as an exception to the rule. The rule is, Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. The exception to that rule is, all things are possible with God. If somebody is exceptionally rich and also exceptionally Jesus-like, they can get in. But he wrote a whole book about how, it's, how you should be rich. And if you're not rich, you are not a godly person. I'm dead serious. He said, in chapter one, there are three types of prosperity. There's spiritual prosperity, mental prosperity, and physical prosperity. And if you're in alignment with Jesus, then you'll be prospering in all three ways. I.e., if you are godlike, if you are following in Jesus' footsteps, you will be rich. If you are poor, it's because you are not like Jesus. That is what he says in this book. And it's deeply entertaining to read. So let's give this a read and see what he has to say for himself. This is still chapter one. There are only four chapters in this book, but oh my God, they're so long. This subheading in the book is prosperity, the world versus God. And apparently this goes on for like 12 pages. What is it with evangelical nutbags and poor structuring in books? I don't understand it. If you have a chapter length, then stick to it, it seems to me, right? Anyway, let's uh, read this, this subheading here and see what it has to say. Once again, we have the world's information opposing God's information. If you know what God thinks or what he has said, then you know you have a very easy task of thinking and believing the same way. If you know what God has said, you cannot be deceived. To the world, prosperity, like everything else, is completely born of the senses or the sense-ruled mind. The f what the hell does that mean? The world is governed by a natural impulse and the physical senses. I don't understand. I feel like he's just being cryptic and confusing for no reason. What does this sentence mean? The world is governed by natural impulse and by the physical senses. What does he mean by that? Is there something that, like, some insight that I don't have because... I'm no longer a Christian? Is there something special about this? I just don't get it. What the hell does it mean? Its slogan is seeing is believing. What's slogan is seeing is believing? The world's slogan? If you can see it, taste it, hear it, smell it, or feel it, then it must be true. If you can't contact it with your physical senses, it's not true. Oh, okay. I see. So he's seemingly moved from defending prosperity gospel send me your money and you will get more in your own account he's moved from that to 
God is real, the naysayers shouldn't say nay any longer. Seems like that's what he's saying, right? Well, look, I don't care if I can see it, taste it, hear it, smell it, or feel it. That's I, irrelevant, honestly. It really is. If you can prove it to me in any other way, I'll believe it. Simple as that. If you pray to God that this person gets $50 million from the lottery or whatever, and they win $50 million from the lottery, you got a believer in me just like that. Boom. Isn't it interesting that that's never how it works, though? As we've discussed earlier in this chapter, the world's definition of prosperity is very limited in its scope, financial ability, and power. In fact, it goes only this far by its own admission. The world itself admits that it has no power to overcome poverty, sickness, spiritual ills, or social ills. Okay, I, I don't know what any of this means, but all right. True prosperity is the ability to use God's power to meet the needs of mankind in any realm of life. This covers much more than just finances, politics, and society. Money is not the only degree of prosperity. You can have all the money in the world and still be poverty-stricken spiritually, mentally, and physically. No, you can't. You cannot have all the money in the world and be poverty-stricken physically at the very least. Mentally, yeah. Spiritually, don't know what that means. But physically, no, it seems to me that if you are rich, by definition, it means that you are rich, right? Now, aside from all of that, let me tell you guys something that, that really, really bothers me that I hear from rich people a lot. Money cannot bring you happiness. That's bull****. Yes, it does. It does bring you happiness, actually. It buys happiness. Absolutely. You telling me that I would be unhappy on an Alaskan cruise that I spent $30,000 on, that I'm sailing from, like, Alaska all the way around to Russia and China and for 30 days straight. You telling me I'm going to be unhappy on that cruise? Money could purchase that for me, and that is most definitely happiness going on that cruise. Absolutely. Money buys happiness. Anybody who says any differently is lying to you. The idea that money can't buy happiness is a delusion granted to the poor by the rich. Don't buy it. And I'm willing to bet about anything that Kenneth Copeland is about to lay that one on us. He's about to tell us money can't buy happiness, so you should send me all of your money. That will make you happy. Trust me. I'd be willing to bet just about anything that that's what he's about to say. Money is the lowest form of power that exists on earth. Do you know what the, what is the highest? The power of prayer. No. Money is tantamount to power in the United States at the very least. You can do an awful lot with money. You can pray in the name of Jesus and God will use his ability to handle your situation, whatever it is. It takes the power of God to make you completely whole. God's power is the only power that covers the entire spectrum of human existence. God is more than enough. No, people need money to survive. God is not enough. To live a prosperous life, your soul must prosper in all the truth of the word. God's power is in direct relationship with his word. What does that even mean? Is he just spouting nonsense? Am I too dumb to understand? What? What does any of this mean? He has used his word to release his power. He has sent his word to us so that we may be in contact with his great power. Isaiah was quoting God himself when he wrote, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Okay, this is why I don't read the King James Version. There's no reason that it should be that confusing and cryptic. Why don't we just use Bibles that are written in a language that modern-day Americans understand. I don't get why he's so obsessed, and many of these other preachers are obsessed with using King James. His power covers the entire spectrum of human existence. So also then does his word. We can see it in scriptures such as Hebrews 1.3 that says he is upholding all things by the word of his power, and Hebrews 4.12-13 that the word is a living thing which covers spirit, soul, body, and thought life. Uh, okay, that sentence didn't really make any sense. Look, this book was written in 1974. There is no reason for poor grammatical structure 
and nonsensical sentences at this point, okay? It should have been. And, and he, you know what else? He's like $750 million richer now than he was then. He should have hired another, what do they call it, grammatician or something editor to go in and correct any errors in his books because this is bad dude did he expect anybody to even read this did he just expect people to purchase it because it's you know his name on the front and then just stick it on their bookshelf and walk away is that why he just didn't give a shit about how the grammar looks this is just bad it even goes so far as to say that nothing in the earth is hidden from the word of god your faith is in direct relation to the level of the word in you Okay, I, I feel like that sentence doesn't really make any sense either. Get your word level up so that you can believe spiritually, mentally, physically, financially, and socially. Is he saying that you need to read the Bible more? Is he saying you need to believe more? I don't know what he's trying to communicate here. Thus, you will be in the position to handle any problem that comes your way according to the word of God. You may not have the answer, but God has. Getting through to you is his only difficulty. God always knows the answer, but we are not always in a position to hear what he is saying. Why is it so complicated to communicate with God to get what he's trying to say to us? Why? He created this whole planet, didn't he? And everybody on it, and he's all powerful. Can't he just snap his fingers and tell us what he wants us to know just like that? If this prosperity garbage really is real, couldn't he just snap his fingers and it would be in our heads? Or, hell, why does he just put a million dollars in everyone's bank account? Why do they have to play this weird little game and have Kenneth Copeland, of all people, explain how to get rich? This is really, at its face, a get-rich-quick book. That's what this is, except the scam in it doesn't actually get you rich, doesn't have a chance of getting you rich. Of course, that's true about every get-rich-quick book, I suppose, but just ridiculous, dude. Ridiculous on every level. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Matthew twenty one thirteen. Prosperity gospel in a nutshell. Absolutely. Thanks for the uh, super chat. You're surely number one pony. I just don't understand how they forget all those verses in the Bible about a camel fitting through the eye of a needle and, you know, den of robbers and all this other stuff directly contradicts the things that Copeland says in this book. And he says it anyways, as though he has some special connection to God that no one else has. Just confusing garbage. Fun fact, the saying, money can't buy happiness, was originally created to mean excess wealth doesn't make you happier. It's only been changed to mean don't ask for enough money to be comfortable because it won't make you happy recently. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Supposedly, there's like a number where you get diminishing returns. You're not going to be more happy if you have a million dollars than if you have 10 million or 50 million or a billion. There isn't another level of happiness beyond that that you can attain. Honestly, if all of your bills are paid and you get to have experiences that are fun and you can take care of the people around you, that's what really matters. That's what contributes to happiness, and you can't do any of that shit unless you have money. Money brings happiness. If you can believe God for healing, uh, for faith healing, that's what he's referring to, help someone else get healed. Spread it around. If you know how to believe God financially, start helping the people around you. You will begin to grow as you reach out to others. In John 14, 18 to 23, Jesus was teaching his disciples and gave the perfect outline of prosperity. Okay, I'm not reading his translation here because, first of all, I don't like the new... Or, I'm sorry. First of all, I don't like the King James Version, if that is indeed what he's even reading from. And second, I don't trust it. I don't trust Kenneth Copeland or anything that he puts out. I have a Bible here that I will read from. John 14, 18 to 23. I spent the first 18 years of my life learning to flip to a Bible book nearly instantly. What a wasted fucking talent, right? It's like not useful at all in any way. And to think I could have been learning about science and evolution instead of this stupid shit. Okay, let's see. 14, 18 to 23. Here we go. It is in red, so it means Jesus is saying it. In these verses, supposedly Jesus is endorsing and supporting prosperity gospel, according to Kenneth Copeland. As we go through these verses, let's analyze and see if Jesus really is endorsing being filthy rich and turning to God to be filthy rich, okay? 18 to 23. 
I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you. That's what she said. I have no idea what the point is here. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. This part is in black. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not the world? And here's verse 23. This is Jesus again. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Those words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. So let me ask you, does that back up prosperity gospel like Kenneth Copeland claims? I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. I'm not like connecting the dots here. What's he trying to communicate? In what way does Jesus endorse being filthy fucking rich in those verses? Let's keep reading uh, Copeland's book here. This is speaking of a manifestation of God. When God manifests himself to you and lives with you, then you are living in prosperity. That's not what the verse is said at all. You see, God by the Holy Spirit is here in the world. He's ready to move whenever a sinner makes Jesus the Lord of his life, but he will not manifest himself in a person's life until that person calls on him. If God's presence were enough, every human being on earth would get saved because we are all in the presence of the Holy Spirit. He was sent to earth on the day of Pentecost and is still here today. The manifestation of God is the important thing. When we operate in the word of God, when we keep his word, then Jesus will manifest himself or make himself real to us. He won't just be there. He will live there. Do you see the difference? No. No, I don't, actually. This sounds like complete nonsense. If we put his word first in our lives, Jesus will reveal himself to us. Then, whenever a problem arises in the physical realm, we know the answer is in his word. We also know the great one living in us will put us over when we act on that word, no matter how impossible the situation is. Some people are waiting for a special manifestation of God's grace before they will get saved, but they don't have to wait at all. We are born of his word. If a man will confess Jesus as Lord and believe that God has raised him from the dead, he will be saved. Okay, well, here's the thing. I did that. I did all that, and Jesus never manifested to me. Did I just not do it right? Did I not love Jesus enough? This is complete garbage, dude. If there's evidence, then show it. Stop messing around and telling me I just didn't do a good enough job or any of that garbage. If God is real, Jesus is real, if they really are there and can give me all the money that I want, just fucking do it! What's with all this messing around? Seriously. Welcome to the fight against the law of attraction, Telltale. Yeah, that's basically what this is, the law of attraction for Christians. Prosperity gospel. If a man will confess Jesus as Lord and believe that God has raised him from the dead, he will be saved. It is a simple matter of believing God's word. Well, I believed it, and I never got filthy rich from believing it. You don't have to wait to receive salvation. It is being offered. You don't have to wait to receive prosperity. It's being offered. These things are offered by Jesus and his word. I.e., if you love Jesus enough, he will make you rich. That's the point he's trying to communicate right now. Disgusting. You know, the Bible says in Philippians 4.19 that God will meet your needs according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ, not according to your need. Okay, don't know what that means. I have heard it preached that if you ask God for $100 but need only $20, you will probably just get 10 You won't find that in the Bible, but God does say, If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall, li- I'm sorry, and ye shall have them. Mark 11:24. is that real? Does it actually say that? Let's look that one up. Mark 11:24. Okay, here's what Mark 11:24 says. Therefore I tell you, it's in red, so Jesus said it. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you will have, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, this is 25, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Let's get a little more context here. This is verse 20. 
In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Whatever this is 24, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you will have received it. Okay, so this is kind of like the if you have faith the size of a mustard grain, then you can tell you can order a mountain to move into the sea and it will. Okay. well, I'll tell you what, when somebody gets rich from praying and that's unequivocally proven to be true, that that's possible. When somebody prays and actually moves a mountain physically into the sea, and it's unequivocally proven that that is the thing that caused it, I'll believe it. Simple as that. Unfortunately, there is zero evidence for any of this garbage. Kenneth Copeland is just trying to peddle nonsense. This is the law of attraction for Christians. When you act on the word of God, the desires of your heart will begin to grow and line up with God. Then he can cause all grace to abound toward you. The first step is to get your mind off of yourself. Begin to take up the needs of the body of Christ as if they were your own. Okay, so stop thinking about getting money. Here's how you get money. Stop thinking about getting money and start thinking about donating your time and money to me. That's what he's saying. The word states very plainly that if a man comes to you needing food and clothes, don't just pray for him and send him away cold and hungry. Feed him and clothe him. Well, I thought prayer worked, right? If you pray for something, it's delivered. I don't understand. Another thing, God will not just meet your needs according to your job. Businessmen have come to me and said that these things work for for me only because I am a preacher, but this is foolishness. I know preachers everywhere it's not working for. Some men say, but I don't have the opportunity for people to give to me. I'm not out preaching. They don't think of me when they give. I have to work for mine. Well, if you have more faith in your job and your own ability to work than you have in the word of God, then it definitely won't work for you. God will certainly use what is available in your job to bless you or even get you a better one. But he is not limited to your job unless you limit him to it. If you will stop and think for a moment, God did not make his covenant with a preacher. He made it with a farmer, a working man named Abram. The scriptures show that Abram turned to the Sodomite king and said, (laughs) God, that word. I don't even want the string from your sandal because you could say a man made Abram rich. No man made Abram rich. God made him rich. Can you see this? Yeah, I'm not really sure what he's referring to here, but uh, I'm sorry, man. God didn't make anybody rich. Certainly didn't make Kenneth Copeland rich. Kenneth Copeland scammed gullible suckers out of every penny that they own. That's how Kenneth Copeland got rich. Oh, plus lots of natural gas on his property. That's how he got rich, actually. There's a basic fundamental truth that runs throughout the entire Bible, throughout God's history of dealing with man. Every time there was a need, no matter what that need was, God had a man somewhere who had the resources, spiritually, mentally, or financially, to meet that need. Seems to me Kenneth Copeland, being almost a billionaire, has those resources. Seems to me that he's the guy that could donate mass amounts of money to people to make their lives better, but does he? Of course not. He leaves that up to God. For Israel, there was Moses. For the world, there was Jesus. For Jesus, there was a man with a donkey. What? Okay. For Ephesus, there was Paul. The Bible says God gave gifts to men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He had a man to provide every need. No one person will ever be so spiritual that he doesn't need other people. We all need one another. Begin to include the body of Christ in your needs. Begin to include the lost in your needs. Is this? Okay, I feel like he's starting to hint at people should be sending him cash, right? If a man came to you needing clothes and you didn't have any clothes to give him, both of you would be in trouble. You need clothes for yourself and you need to be able to supply him with clothes. Jesus said, why do you worry about what you will eat and what you will wear? Your heavenly father knows you have need of these things. But he also said, give And it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give in your bosom. 
That's another word you don't hear out of uh, religious circles, right? You only ever hear certain words within religious circles. Here's a list of those words. I've been writing them down. Exhort, obeisance, haughty, and now bosom. When I realized this and began to, to consider the needs of others before my own, I found that my needs were met supernaturally. It was uncanny. I bet. I bet. Yeah. You gave your preacher every penny you owned, and suddenly you open your closet door and there's a safe full of even more money. Right, Kenneth? Is that what happened? You give a preacher your mortgage money. You give a preacher your car insurance money, your food budget that you need for the month. And just like that, God puts more money in your pocket supernaturally. Totally, totally. I had spent practically all of my adult life in debt. I thought earlier he said that he didn't put himself in debt, ever. He did. Earlier in the book, he said he, he never put himself in debt, ever. Am I misremembering? It seemed that every business venture I tried just fell apart, leaving me even further in debt. Then I turned to the Lord. You know, I, I have zero debt. You know why? Because I was an addict for years and wrecked my fucking credit beyond repair. And nobody would loan a fucking dime to me at this point. Banks won't even think about loaning money to me. I'm lucky that I have a bank account because I wrecked my credit so badly when I was an addict. So I guess that's one way of resolving the whole debt problem, right? Put yourself in a position where nobody will loan you a fucking dime. Apparently, he really cared about his credit rating and stuff enough to, you know, be able to have it high enough that people would, like, loan money to him and stuff. Actually, when was a credit rating invented? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Credit ratings were created in 1989. Uh, this book was written in 1974, I believe. So, yeah, before credit ratings, I guess. It seemed that every business venture I tried just fell apart, leaving me even further in debt. Then I turned to the Lord, determined to commit myself to his word, and began walking my bedroom floor with my Bible in my fist, shouting at the top of my voice, God meets all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Yeah, you probably looked like a fucking nutcase while you did it too. I just kept confessing this hour after hour, day after day. My situation looked absolutely impossible at the time. I had no place to preach and nothing much to say. One... One thing I could say was, my God meets all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I knew that sentence very well. Eleven months later, I was completely out of debt. In the meantime, I learned to include other people in my needs by giving to them and getting involved with them. When I began to give, I suddenly realized one day how very busy I was with God's work. Years have come and gone and I haven't caught up yet. When you do this, God will move heaven and earth, if necessary, to reach you. Now, a big question in the minds of many Christians is, does Satan bless people financially? Good question. Many times it looks as though the ungodly men have all the money, but this is not true. Well, some of them certainly do, right? So it seems to me that maybe nobody's blessing anybody with money. Do you ever consider that one? The Bible doesn't say a fucking word to imply that God makes people rich if they love him enough. That's ridiculous. You know what the Bible does say? It does say it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. But Kenneth conveniently ignores that verse, of course. There is more wealth hidden away than they will ever possess. The Bible says plainly that God will cause us to have the hidden wealth of the world, the hidden riches of the secret places. The, wor the word tells us that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. I've heard that recently even. Robin Bullock's wife did a, uh, a, a whole sermon on that not too long ago. And the idea is non-believers deserve to be poor and believers deserve to have their money. That's a really deeply disturbing idea. It's, it's like a superiority complex that these people have. And I've noticed that this idea isn't just a Christian idea. It's not something that kind of permeates through Christian culture or society. It's very specifically evangelical prosperity gospel society that believes this stuff. Or prosperity gospel culture that believes this stuff. It's like these people... It's, it's like it's only the people that are obsessed 
with the idea that God will make them rich if they just believe it enough. Anyway, let's keep reading. Why then does the sinner have it? Because there are certain facts of financial law that will work when put to work. Israel has proven this. God taught Abraham certain things that the Jews are using today, and they are still working. That's a less than subtle hint that Jews control the financial industry. That's not true, by the way. The idea that Jews control the big banks? Garbage. Complete fucking nonsense. They don't. There is a single big bank, one of the top ten big banks, Goldman Sachs was founded by and currently operated by Jewish people. Only one of the top ten. All of the rest, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, none of them were either founded by or are currently run by Jews. I think there might be like one that has a current Jewish CEO, aside from Goldman Sachs, of course. This is just pure unadulterated anti-Semitism right here, what we're looking at. You won't find a Jew who believes in poverty because poverty is not in the Old Covenant, okay? It is in religion, not in the Bible. It was put into Christianity as a religion during the Dark Ages when the word was taken from the people and put away in monasteries. What? Poverty oaths were fed to Christianity when the religious hierarchy took over. The men operating it were not born-again men. Is he saying... That if you really do believe in God, you will not be poor. The reason that you are poor is because you don't love God enough. I, I think that's what he's trying to say right now. This is fucking crazy, dude. You can look at the world system of finance and see a perfect picture of Satan's whole pattern. It can be stated in just a few words. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. How do you kill a body of water? Stop it from flowing. How do you kill a physical body? Stop it from functioning. How do you kill the body of Christ financially? Pile up all the money in reservoirs and stop it from moving. Satan is a deceiver. Absolutely nothing he does is a blessing. Proverbs 132 confirms this. The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Okay. It may look as if he is blessing, but he, is, but he always destroys. He always presents a dead end and no way out. In fact, if you want to discern between the work of God and the work of Satan, remember, Satan always tells you there is no way out, but Jesus says, I am the way. When does Satan ever say there's no way out? What? Are you, what? What's he talking about? If it is doubt, defeat, or discouragement, it is from Satan. Always. Okay. By believing God and including the needs of the body of Christ in your needs, you become an open channel for the things of God to flow through, the, flow through to others. Everything you've received from God flowed through Jesus. Did Jesus ever lose anything by giving it to you? No, he still owns it all. First John, wait, first John 4.17. Wait, is it 1 John 4.17 or is it like the beginning of a sentence? First, comma, John 4, 17, blah, blah, blah. Is he referring to the Bible book, 1 John? Or is he just, because he's writing it wrong, if that's what he's doing here. 1 John 4, 1, 17 makes a startling statement. As he is, so are we in this world. This does not say as he was or as we are someday going to be. It says as he is, so are we. In his position at the right hand of God, Jesus has more than enough to give. Well, we are his joint heirs, and he is ready to see to it that we have enough to give. So basically what he's trying to communicate right now is if you really love Jesus, you will give him all of your money. I mean, you'll give Kenneth Copeland your money, and Jesus will replace it. And if he doesn't replace your mortgage money or your car insurance or whatever, it's a sign you don't love Jesus enough. It's a you problem, not a me problem. That's what he's trying to communicate here. This is the most predatory BS I've ever seen in my life, honestly. Or damn near it. That's crazy, dude. I don't know. This is absolutely nuts. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. Uh, I'm honestly kind of fascinated by this book. I think it's absolutely crazy. Yours truly, number one pony. You don't get rich writing science fiction. If you want to get rich, you start a religion. L. Ron Hubbard. That's a good quote from him. He also apparently made a bar bet and 
Isaac Asimov was there to witness the bar bet. He acted as like uh, a source for it. He talked about it later in life. The bet was L. Ron Hubbard bet somebody that he could start a religion to make himself rich. And he succeeded gloriously, I guess. The Satan says no way thing is from one of those live, laugh, love type Facebook memes. Oh, absolutely.